Hello there everyone and thank you for rejoining me here in TNO, the last days of Robert F. Kennedy, but the affordable housing act has passed. As the signing ceremony took place in the Oval Office with a flash of the photographer's light bulbs, an assortment of real estate developers, civil rights leaders, and mayors from cities big and small across America applauded as President Robert Kennedy signed the Affordable Housing Act into law. I'm pleased to sign this bill into law, which will make it easier to build affordable, livable, and safe housing for those Americans that can only dream before of home ownership, the President said moments before he signed the law. Today, we say that every family in the United States has the right to own their own home. The new law will allow cities to rezone large swaths of areas into high density residential areas to encourage the development of new construction in the areas where the cost of housing has priced many out of the market and provide low-interest loans to buyers to purchase them. The bill also provides subsidies to develop common areas like parks and shopping centers and help establish mass transit routes from these new developments to the inner city. These new homes do not only be apartment blocks like some opponents had suggested about duplexes. Townhouses, road houses, and other such buildings will allow more people to access to housing that even larger car-focused suburban dwellings are too, that are too expensive or even forbidden for racial minorities to access. Government funding is only provided on the condition that no barriers will be put in place from African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics, or anyone else. Already there's many plans being drawn up for the Kennedy Burgs and every uh, every city in the nation, redeveloping areas that are overlooked and abandoned for years, promising a new construction boom that will last for a decade or more. A man so is his castle, and there will be many more castles soon, too. Nice. Uh, admin efficiency gets worse, but, you know, whatever. Significantly improve the available of, availability of housing across the nation. We have some comments to go through as well, but we're doing the specter of hunger. What good is owning the richest farm land in the world if you cannot feed your people with it? Despite having more food than the world has people, Americans still su shuffle along sidewalks clutching at their stomach. Americans are cities and towns still loiter on diners, malls, and restaurants begging for scraps and leftovers and hoping for good Samaritans to come their way. This is just a stark naked truth. America's bounty is locked behind a rich man's window pane, and its penniless can only stare at the sustenance denied to them from the harsh outside. Progress for America means progress for all of its citizens, its most vulnerable most of all. We must lift them up to a better lot in life by any means necessary. But before anything else, we must approach them with their good intentions. If nothing else, they must know that no American will ever go hungry if President Kennedy gets his way. So, poverty will begin to improve, lead to moderate increase in quality of life, and get more support. What's not to love? Build a safety net. And a healthy society. Its members are free to pursue their own paths for self-fulfillment without their dues becoming too great to burden and to bear. Anyone can become whoever they wish, provided they work in earnest for it. In contrast, a sickly society leaves little room for free expression. and social mobility, everyone has a place in appropriate standing whether they like it or not. In America, that place is dictated by a man's dollars, little earn too little. They cannot dedicate themselves to anything but uh, making enough to get by. It stifles the faculties and puts undue stress on the working man, but more importantly, it man's dissent, which simmers into a violent cauldron of breaking boil. This can be prevented with a robust network of benefits and pensions which they can rely on to make ends meet. Although President Kennedy has promised such whether or not he can back rhetoric with action in the face of bipartisan backlash remains to be seen. A quiet request. We've been approached in a manner of typical, manner typical of delicate request by the Italian government or men acting on behalf of it. The Civiso Informazioni Militare, or Mil Rome's military intelligence body, has asked for trade information we possess on the Italian nationals in return for information they have on American citizens. Naturally, we have approved by the request and informed that we would be open to cooperating within the future of the interests of European stability and anti-subversive intelligence. This will help build Italian democracy. As we're still in West Africa, I guess. Garrison strength was 43%. Um, honestly, Okay, I'm going to be complete, straight up honest. Uh, what is this? Decreases by 1%. Uh, the game is kind of screwed over because, okay, so I, this is all glitched. I gave this to the Germans. The free French no longer exist because I was messing around with this. The war would not end. Even though the war ended, the war literally would not end. So I basically gave the free French to the Germans, which kind of sucks for us, but you know. Um, the game is still not perfectly 100%, which kind of sucks, to be honest with you, with Iron Heights back down here now. Um, it's still very bugged, and I tried to, like, have him annex Mossy Land, but I, I guess I chose him the wrong command, because then annex Muscovy by accident, so... But I want to give this back to the Germans, so... It, it kind of sucks, yeah. There's a couple bugs here and there still, but... It is what it is. So let's need to save some manpower and whatnot, so... Oh, offense, stability stuff over here. This is a pretty good one to do. I want to wait till it gets a little lower before we do anything else there. Um, other than that, uh, we still have stuff here. Two and a half every month. We're at four. God dang it, I hate this so much. It's so annoying doing this. CIA stuff. I just want more political power. I don't know why I clicked on this one too, but whatever. Uh, towards justice. I like to do more of that stuff, but whatever. The rights of the workers. Well, I definitely want to do this one. Build a safety net, but the bitterest of the bitter. And get an ad in the Rust Belt. Cameron collapses, there you go. The American worker struggles one of small victories eked out from the Titanic sacrifice. Noxious smoke, searing heat and blistering feet for 14 hours a day, often more. Bruises and dead bodies littering factory yards while hired thugs protect priceless machines from valueless men. Fair compensation and fair pay is a picket sign as brave men and women stare at the barrel holes of tense firing lines. The government's answer at long last, but only after not before, the inevitable massacre. 
The workers' memory is long and their history are ugly. As blood red as the flags they wave, reaching out to this country's many scorned requests. Acknowledgement from those who had ignored it, and, and we, the government, are to them the worst kind of ignorant. President Kinney can only appeal to the last bit of hope and promise them that the blood they had shed shall not be in vain. Cool. And we do a cup of coffee here as well. We have critical inflation, which is why we did counter pennies, which is helping us out quite a bit, which is improving our growth, and we still have a surplus of 21 billion, as we're trying to cut it down as much as we can. Um, but we'll, we will see, some comments included. Uh, there might be some CIA operations that you can do to get support in the United Kingdom so they don't, so Himmler doesn't lose, but the person says it's been a while since I've played Tino in America, so it might be wrong. So else says, I wonder if it's possible to get one trillion dollars in GDP as RFK. It's possible as, apparently as Harrington, which is really cool. I should play as Harrington again sometime. Well, can I actually play as Harrington again? Huh. Work begins at a new bill. Pretty normal, isn't it? Um, invest in administration, yeah, that'd be good to do. Um, I just want political power, that's all I care about. So we come back here, five, two and a half. This organization, I don't want to spend that much more political power, but getting the chance for two is too great. 33% chance. Ooh, command power is really hard to come by. Political power is much easier to come by. Oh, that, that actually went up, look at that, nice. Oh, uh, that's pretty bad over there, but... Chilean government collapses, huh? Uh, in Angola, it is very bad. 5%. I'd rather just spend political power and money. Um, I don't mind spending money. Trust in government decreases a little bit. Eh, it's alright. It's only the government. A little bit of command power. 5%. Discontent. Yeah, do that one. That's, it's, it is a little bit of command power, but it's not very much. So, but happy September, everybody. We have 7 million in reserve. It's not bad. And the guns, we got more than enough guns. So, for some reason, I thought it was a election year for some reason not sure why but whatever <clears throat> bears of the bitter arose by any other name since Kennedy's great and American tour we've made many strides in decreasing the appeal of our reforms in the US every day that passes oh look at that oh French Civil War wait what um, that passes another day where we make our cases to the American people or the NPP's ranks, and particularly the progressive caucus ranks grow in number. But the good that we've done here must not be constrained to our borders. As a free world's greatest champion, it's a responsibility to cultivate support of our newfound freedoms overseas. With that in mind, the Kennedy administration established a think tank for individuals who share its will to spread freedom of and by for the people, but not its means. They'll work with our member, neighbors and member states of the OFN, drafting policies that both align with the country's priorities and further their own people's inalienable rights. In due time, America will spearhead a new breath, breath of freedom. For a world filled with tyrants and roses international is the spirit tip of this very noble endeavor. What the heck is going on in France? Is this supposed to happen? Or did I muck it up? Um, organization, Army Secret. Movement de Reconciliation Nationale, French State. Ministère Français. Nazism. French Resistance. Liberalism. And then there's these guys. The orange shots this is, must be like, what the crap is going on down here? Well, we have one destroyed France, and a second destroyed France. Why not a third destroyed France? Five days left, it's not bad. 74, my god. We're, we're slowly catching up. Slowly. Oh my god. And... This one's not worth doing because you have a chance of reducing by 1 or 1.25. I'd rather increase ours more. If we get one more month, we can increase ours even more than they currently have it too. So I do want to invest in the admin though. And more cost, which sucks, but our admin... Oh, minus 0.34, Jesus Christ, that's pretty good. But, ooh, that's pretty good too. Look at that. Nice. Um, Chilean bureaucracy still going up. Uh, oh, tax them. Oh, that's not good. Oh, Shinekis. We're spending so much on city stuff. Oh, Jesus. Test the waters. And it's education reform. Rose by any other name. But we have an event to read too. Somewhere here. Oh, God, God. An ad in the Rust Belt. There has been such. A uh, single constant in nation's history, the hard-working men and women will always be there to forge new trails, dig out resources, um, establish new farms, turn iron to steel, and build our greatest landmarks, and the strongest economy in the world. Isn't that time they should be rewarded? Um, the new social security system will help all workers across the nation, ensuring that in the event of injury or ill health, if trouble times lie ahead, or you have reached 65 and are ready to retire, that you'll still be helped and cared for with a pension and that aid, so that you can live a life of decency and honor to thank you for the hard work that helped build our nation. I'm President Robert Kennedy, and I approve this message. More support. Workers' rights will begin to slightly improve. Okay. Nice. 
every place is going to get a couple of these because I want more admin points or more political power. I'm just trying to expand the bureaucracy by doing this. Literally just the bureaucracy, nothing else. But happy October as we hit a new month for us. Every single state is going to get one of these. Just like nuclear reactors, we'll rebuild those next two. Oh, I love conflict in my war games. Fuel silos, thermoelectric plants, sure. Thermoelectric, yeah. Nuclear reactors, oh, you know what? Let's get these off. That's nice and all. Yeah. Build a couple of these. We want to get that green energy going. Alternative fuel is the way of the future. Well, alternative until it becomes the non-alternative and becomes the main power source. Which I should probably look into it for myself. From Russia with love. Um, if you're worried about this, please go right ahead. Don't want to get New York City. Seems like the red is back in fashion. Oh, here we go. <gasps> We're in the lead. I hate this so much, but I can, we, can, uh, uh, we can do well with this. That's where we spend our command power. Frontline bombing. Trust in government. I love bombing people. I'm such an American. We still pull out, but when in doubt, I don't pull out. You know, words to live by. Maybe not. I don't know. I think I don't have any kids. Um, fight for the schools, schools and workers. We could, but we gotta save our PP. We don't have enough. Thirteen billion is not enough. One hundred forty billion is not going down fast enough. Oh, but you know what? It's all right. We'll just spend even more. But this gives us more taxable population, more stability, security, actual effectiveness, pollution, safety. So, that's okay. We don't have a navy, but ah, don't ask about that. Don't ask about the navy. Uh, fight for the future. Test the waters. No child left behind. It's going to be costly. Fight for the future. A day when all will come, when uh, all are gathered here, they will leave this earth for the pearly gates paradise. A bodies may turn to ash, or names may scatter the winds, forgotten, but the actions that define our lives will leave an indelible mark on the ground we tread in the air we breathe. But such a time our sons and daughters will inherit the world which we had shaped into our own image, can we in good conscience leave them with ruins that can neither to comprehend nor restore? This administration has endeavored to scare the future of our children, your children, through making changes to our country's economic, social, and political structures. With affordable housing, your children will possess the greatest security civilization provides. With affordable health care, your children will possess a slightly, or mightily, mighty bulwark against malaise and injury. And with affordable education, your children will possess the knowledge of how not to only survive, but to prosper and stand on their own two feet long after you're gone. Pretty much. Rose by any other names. Rose is international. Did I read that one? I thought I did. Oh well. Or maybe not. My bad. Oh, here it is. President Robert Kennedy has only been focusing on the welfare of his own nation's people. In the fight against international fascism, it's important to strengthen your allies as well. To then, his administration's push to create the Roses International, an international program to help fund anti poverty efforts across organizations, free nations, funds and knowledge from America's own fight against poverty to be made at Canada, Australia, and New Zealand to help the lowliest of the low and their societies rise up with improved health, welfare, education, and more. Average to be made, especially with the native peoples of the lands, the First Nations in Canada, the Aborigines in Australia, the Maori, Maori, and New Zealand who have suffered some systematic racism, much like African Americans and Indians in the U.S. have. Overall, the program has been well received. If, with a bit of grumbling by the Prime Minister and the MPs of our allies, that they should handle it, thank you very much. But we can be proud of the fact that we're willing to help not just the poor in our nation, but the poor around the world. Bread and roses too. Spend a lot of money. New untried reforms are the inherent risk of failing and becoming sinkholes for taxpayers. Policy planners may pre make predictions based on theory and advise accordingly, but a law's performance can only be measured only after it's implemented, not before. Without caution or restraining the hastiness of politicians who pine for reforms, America, America will see a hundred good laws passed in a hundred days and a hundred failures that burden its treasure for little gain. For his part, the president is keen to remind the MPP congressmen and the constituents that lasting reform will come in due time. At the same time, we authorize a cabinet to implement a backlog of policies at a small scale as test programs of sorts. With them, we can acquire much needed data on how well our reform achieves achieve their objectives while having expanded too much money on abject England failures. joins OFM. Since England's gamble for power and favors in the battle for the Atlantic came to an end, having accomplished exactly the opposite of what it set out to do, the OFM has managed to chain England using the very conference which was meant to ensure diplomatic independence. Through using the fear of the Germans and minimal power wielded by the English attempting to mediate the conference, England has simply become too reliant on the OFM and has been pressured into joining America's sphere of influence. Of course, the picture's not gone unnoticed by the other powers of the OFN, and the public is undoubtedly thrilled as to the English finally being brought back into the sphere of America. From this point onwards, we can say with certainty that Europe has found itself a safer place as OFN ships once more sail into the Atlantic Ocean and American troops begin to garrison the Isles. We cannot expect the reception of the OFN moving into England to be wholly a positive one, of course. While there's been a considerable amount of celebrations occurring across the nation, not all those taking to the streets have been celebrating. This desperate protest has broken out across England. 
are especially angered the Prime Minister's government for mismanaging the battle for the Atlantic. Unfortunately, England's own incompetencies must be dealt with by themselves for now. We can celebrate a diplomatic victory over the Germans and begin drafting up how we can make the most of our new English allies. Who says you don't get second chances? Nice. Which, we were doing all this stuff earlier. Which I was complaining about earlier, which is a pain in the butt. We barely made it. I mean, that, the, the Germans didn't even try, but they are just men in Babylon. On 100 million television te uh, televisions, the face of RFK, President of the U.S., flickered into being. He sat in the Oval Office, back in the presidential seal, looking into the lens. With a sharp breath, he began. <clears throat> My fellow Americans, I come to you today to share with you my vision for America. While my travels across this great nation, the world's richest, I've seen in the bits of poverty that so many of our brothers and sisters are born into and die in. A miasma of depression from which there's no escape for even the willing who are not provided the tools and resources to better their lives. It's a fallacy too often espoused by the callous and uncaring that people who are in poverty choose to be there, or are rightfully deprived of the means to the pursuit of happiness due to the color, class, or faith. When any American denies to extend a helping hand to his fellow citizen, he denies America. Some are happy to turn their heads or to snatch crumbs out of the mouths of the hungry, but I will not stand idly by while American children starve, while American women die in childbirth, while American workers are paid too little to support their families. We're better than that. We have the means to lift up every American out of the depths of poverty, and I intend to make that beautiful dream a reality. In the coming years, my administration will de dedicate itself to the creation of innovative new agencies and programs that will provide much-needed welfare to impoverished Americans nationwide. We shall not rest until every American is provided the means of their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those three unalienable rights have been denied to all too many Americans. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America. In his darkened mansion, a man watched the president's address. As Kennedy finished, his wrinkled, spotted liver hand, spotted hand, lethargically reached for the receiver of the pristine white telephone sitting beside him. He dialed the long, familiar number and listened to the dial tone. When it finally connected, he said in his scratchy, smoker's voice, We've got to do something about this guy. Oh boy. Community action. Successfully implementing laws requires a willful participation of local communities and their leading figures. The importance to the lasting impact of the president's reforms cannot be understated. M. In fact, the result of many of his programs of borns uh, itself to the extent in which the community enforces them. Those who look favorably at President Kennedy's policies will not hesitate to follow both their letter and extent. Conversely, those who do not will play every trick in the book to keep them from enforcing even the former. Securing the loyalties becomes even easier when they voluntarily offer their own support for this outcome. President Kennedy intends to address their inhabitants, whether in person or through broadcast. His opponents raise comparisons to door-to-door -door salesmen, but if it works, then why bother complaining? Nice. Ah, yes. So at least that one's done. That's good. Um, towards justice. I'm going for poverty. That's what I really care about here. Um, we're over now stable as well, which is fine. Over here, we're just kind of hanging out. Send manpower. Depletion decreases. And that seems pretty good to us. Garrison increase. Uh, garrison strength increases too, which is pretty nice as well. Um, sure, I'll send this one too. Eisenhower's journey across the Thames. General Ike. Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, the savior of the American dream, the torchbearer of the American spear, former President Dwight D. Eisenhower earned all those ranks into idols throughout the journey, or as many years of eventual life, and now after raising the United States up from the despair of defeat, he has seen his work bear fruit as he journeys to an England free of the German overlords, having recently entered the Organization of Free Nations. Yay! General Marshall Ferguson here fought to the last bullet alongside me right here, same as Major Crawford over there, the former president said, as Sears dropped riveted drops rivered across the Scottish border as blood so did long ago. Many veterans of the final line of Allied defense in the British Isles gathered to commemorate the event alongside former President Eisenhower. As the faces of hundreds of scarred, wrinkled old warriors passed through, dozens of news crews from across the globe gathered to witness the event as well as many government officials of the new, only, new OFN aligned English government came to greet the President and thank him for never giving up hope for the nation of the British. This has been the EBC Nightly News show wishing you a bright, day for the, day, bright light for the day of tomorrow. The beacon of liberty stretches your touch. You don't need that one. Um, don't really need that one either. A curse for a fat purse. Once again, Democrat strongman Barry Goldwater speaking to the Senate floor to speak against their policies. This time he was rallied against what he termed a reckless spending by the president on welfare and education programs. After advocating for a massive reduction in spending on government programs, Goldwater ended his tirade by quoting former President James Madison. Charities know part of the legislative duty of the government to thunder applause from his Democrat cronies and plenty of our own supposed party brothers in the MPP. He is, as usual, completely wrong, but has managed to trick plenty of our, of our more easily led citizens into agreeing with him and demanding to reduce government spending, often in areas they directly benefit from. If Goldwater had his way, he'd cut welfare programs up like a Thanksgiving dinner, or turkey, denying millions of Americans essential aid they require to lift themselves out of poverty's clutches. It seems that they prefer government revenue to gather dust in a vault somewhere, but what would be good of that? The purpose of taxation is the funding of programs to benefit the taxpayer, and as the government of the United States, it is our duty to ensure Americans have the highest quality of life possible. What can all that vocal and influential reaction is prevent us from achieving a brighter future for every American? This nation cannot be truly great until not a single child goes hungry, an American, or America, worth fighting for. No child left behind. America's future 
uh, fortunes are intertwined with that of its children today. Their successes are country's success. Their failings are country's failings. The strength and longevity of American society and the American values rely on its pillars. And well-fed, well-taught, and well-dressed children will surely become pillars of mighty stone. R. Children's future foretells America's future. Therefore, it's a government's responsibility to create an environment in which they can all blossom to their full potential. As education reform is an integral component, component of the MPP's agenda, plans are being drawn for nationwide programs aimed at increasing both the children enrolled in our schools and the quality of education they receive. America should not leave its children behind, and President Kennedy pledges to make that boast a reality. This is really bad here. Minus 0.3. It used to be minus 0.27, for the love of God. A voice even louder. Months ago, or months past, the West African war raged on, and American soldiers continued to come home wounded in body bags. Concern deepened and protests intensified with popular anger spreading across the political spectrum. One such manifestation of the people's rage was seen on a cloudy morning by two students at the New York University. Walking to the first class of the day, they noticed a huge crowd of people surrounded by the reporters and photographers carrying anti-war placards and listening to a woman speak from behind a lectern. The heck's that? One student asked the other. After squinting at the placards and the woman, the second student made his reply, This is... It's this Phyllis Schleifey lady. She's having a rally against the war. The first student laughed. You're kidding me. My mom loves her. She's all the talking nowadays. God, it's effing weird how the only person actually talking about this BS war is some crazy Midwestern wife with views straight out of the 1850s. As the crowd grew in size and noise, the two students laughed at the absurdity of it all. Phyllis Schleifey's audience grows and the Economic Opportunity Act. With Congress convinced and the American people to peace, there's no better time to hold the culmination of work, money, and time to a vote. To a vote. The economy or economic Opportunity Bill is one of several proposals comprising what history will consider the most comprehensive piece of economic reform introduced at Capitol Hill since the New Deal era, from large schools, grants, and nationwide, uh, oh boy, um, uh, nationwide vocational training programs, federal food charities, cheap houses, as a panoply of measures both guaranteed and experimental with intent of tackling and or hopefully reducing the specter of American poverty. The world poverty may not even end in our generation, but our children's generation, or their children's, but we will sound its death knell with the best bills in its enshrinement, and that's the world that its days are numbered. In a hundred years or a thousand, the American people will celebrate a mission accomplished, take pride of having laid down the foundations of their triumph, and we're going to stay here real quick, because I'm pretty sure it's in 672 we get uh, Romney, but it could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, then I'm going to wait and uh, we'll do election season, but we're going to continue voting for the MPP for now. What are the predictions of votes? Oh, wow. That's actually really cool. The progressives get way more, while the nationals go way down. Um, and you get a few more Democrats, and you lose some Republicans, which is fine with us. Because we want the center. Equal. What we really care about, so make sure our kid doesn't get assassinated, is equal to any other president, is what we really want. So, that's what we really care about. Pull out of Africa, one, like I said, when I doubt, when I doubt, I definitely do not keep up. Anyways. Community action, my friends. Federal food banks, nice. Very high unity is also very good, too. Calling on the community. The war against poverty, the fight for basic human rights and decency is one of my administration has done its utmost to fight. We've been pushing reforms and expansions of the welfare state to cover as many Americans as we can to create a baseline and safety net to catch those that fall and need our help. However, it's not just a job of the government to facilitate, it's the work of the whole nation. Every one of us needs a pitch in to help the underprivileged and poor, the sick and broken, so that everyone can reach their full potential. For only then, when all Americans in all 50 states and every community to greet and small help their neighbors, family, and friends, we can finally defeat the disease and scourge of poverty that has plagued humanity for thousands of years. So I call on all Americans, from New York to San Francisco, from Minneapolis to Houston, and all the points in between, your communities need you. Volunteers and donations are needed for an innumerable number of organizations tackling everything from school lunches to adult literacy to homeless shelters. Donating your time or money to both is a great way to tell your community. We'll not leave you behind, we'll help you. We'll help you keep warm, fed, and safe. And applause Bobby Kennedy finishes his speech to Stephanie as he waves to the crowd and showing off his famous smile. Statistics already know that the poverty rate in America is decreasing with a boost of welfare, the support for medical services, and the improvement of labor rights. And the cheer on top, the National Progressive Pact, which is famous for not agreeing on anything. Somehow it's all come together to support the president's work. All in all, a job well done. We'll leave the nation a better place than we found it. Now we read this one too, but then the rights of workers. The rights to life, liberty, and the right to pursue happiness. These are what our founding fathers called America's in inalienable rights. Those which the Lord God guaranteed to every man and woman with his bounds as... A uh, matter of course, it is and should be America's government duty to secure these rights for its own citizens as, set as an instrument of its will. Unfortunately, we've fallen short of the responsibilities of our forefathers at once enshrined. Today, the American worker lives without the financial and personal securities which allow him to live freely and pursue what makes them happy. It's a problem that President Kennedy has pledged to rectify, though figuring out the peculiarities of the situation will take some time. Ah. Oh, crap. The Federal Student Aid Act. An automotive plant in De Detroit, Michigan, 2.26 p.m. After 12 years of welding, welding car doors, a man develops a bit to shut himself off from the heat and clanger out of the factory floor. 
As his body mechanically clears out his duties, Frank Gordon's mind retreated along the obscure pathways of the subconscious of Father Working Day in his mind's eye. Frank saw his daughters and his wife trying to remind himself why he endured the ordeals of the factory. It was a hard lot, the bosses didn't make it any easier. After a few years of 12, Frank met a new guy to the plan and began to speak quietly to the others about labor rights and that most forbidden topic, unions. Eventually he invited Frank and some of the others to a meeting. This is how Frank Gordon became a communist. Oh boy. Of course, he had the nagging cessation that they were just using him all, but all the suits in Washington did was smile and lie. He grew to hate them with a passion that burned with them like hot coals, that everlasting fear of becoming the only thing keeping him going. Day after day, one minute's go paycheck after another. At first, Frank had thought Kennedy to be just another smiling white snake like the rest of them, but when his wife became a fervent supporter of his, Frank became forced to reevaluate him. His policies had begun to affect his own quality of life, raising his living standards to a level he never thought possible. All those years, the bosses grew fat out their toil, while they could barely scrape enough together to pay the bills. What a communist accomplished other than talking endlessly. Finishing one door and on to the next, Frank decided to begin stepping back from the communists. Kennedy might just be another Washington suit, but at least he was doing something tangible for the working man. To be radical is to grasp things by the root. Nice. And also, we have how much support here? So that's 8, 12, that's 40, 43. We need all of them here, pretty much. So we might need to use some funky stuff here to get where we need to be, but a church in Fairfield, can, uh, Connecticut. Claire definitely tried to make her shivering less obvious by hugging her arms to her chest. Her husband wisely doing the same set her. God, I mean, God darn it, as she thought. Why can't they turn the heat on at mass? As if that wasn't bad enough, Father Kendrick's sermon today was on the virtue of a consistency. Constancy. Hardly the most thrilling stuff. As the father's words washed over her like gentle lulling waves, she found herself drifting into the vague consideration of the current political landscape. All they seemed to talk about was on the radio where President Kennedy's new reforms, each more radical than the last, it had begun to worry her significantly. Like everyone else she had known, she, she'd gone all in on Kennedy back in 64. As not that she hadn't wanted a liberal president, but a lot of his recent policies seemed to be cleared up to the uh, left, extreme even. Clenching the jaw to stop her teeth chattering, as Father Kendrick's droned on, Clara wondered how many others in the congregation felt the same way. They weren't fond of segregation or authoritarianism, but a lot of President Kennedy's recent policies seemed haunted by the specter of that most horrid thing by all American suburbanite, socialism. Milling it over, Clara decided it had been a good run, but having a Catholic in the White House might not be worth Kennedy's apparent turn towards the radical. What they needed was a liberal, moderate president. Emphasis on moderate. Sighing through her nose, she wondered if the next time she was at the ballot booth, she'd have to commit the ultimate Irish Catholic sin and vote Republican. Huh. The wise man knows not to mess with Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall? Implementing public pensions. It will lose support from unions. Oh boy. Federal minimum wage will gain support. We're gonna go radical. In principle, the fruits of a man's labor blossoms and ripens to their sweetest as he ends his working day. Saving smart and wise investment will guarantee that he can spend the twilight of his life enjoying to the fullest, bliss accompanying him until he breathes his last in warm comfort and warm company. Well, so is true for America's money. The same cannot be said for America's many money less. One must plant seeds before being able to nurture a fruiting tree. After all, and what are our underclasses but sharecroppers who sow seeds bearing only their landlord's name? To the president, the solution is simple. Public pensions will guarantee a portion of the worker's check to a deposit which you will receive upon retirement. In time, this deposit will grow to a healthy extent, enough to sustain their owner's needs until their inevitable Federal departure. Student Aid Act passes. The President RFK, surrounded by the student teachers at Strong John Th Thompson Elementary School in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks from the White House, has signed the Federal Student Aid Act to applaud as news cameras and photographers record the event for posterity. Today, we say that all American students deserve the chance to learn and grow, to become well-informed, smart, and intelligent adults of tomorrow. They make America better than ever. The doctors, teachers, artists, inventors, and leaders of tomorrow are in our schools today, and we must do all we can today to make it tomorrow even better. Um, the FSA Act will set up a new baseline standard for primary and secondary schools in America in mathematics, English, history, science, civics, and more. The federal government will provide money to states and school boards that, due to financial reasons, are unable to raise their schools to the new standards in hiring teachers and expanding classrooms, to promote equality of education across the nation. Other aspects of the law include funding for newer and safer schools, penal penalties for school districts that fail to integrate the schools, and establishing a nonpartisan community to standardize textbooks across the nation. While education groups and civil rights organizations are really pleased with the FSA and their equality and standardization edicts, many states' rights proponents are angry at the law, which is pretty much stripping the local control over education that has long been one of the most important roles of the states. While most of the articles of the law are only those for school districts that require the funds and that are opt-in, the need for money in many the poor states will force them to compromise on their beliefs in order to get the money they need to operate. Nevertheless, the FSA will soon make America one of the best educated nations in the world. An apple for every teacher, a chalkboard for every student. Also, uh, I might not actually be able to get Romney in this campaign, I just realized, because of the way we're campaigning. Um, so if we don't get Romney in this campaign, I'll try my best in the next uh, TNO campaign to get Romney, so I really, really want to try Romney out, so keep in mind, we haven't, so invest in the administration, there we go, we got to. So my apologies that we're not going to get Romney in this campaign, but we're going to play as Romney eventually, I promise you that. I absolutely, oh my god, that's not good enough. Oh, we don't have political power, no wonder. Oh, deficit. Great. Uncle Sam's benevolent gaze. 
It was a tr strange time. The power plants and the water processing facilities had been bombed to dust, but they still been rebuilt. The mines had collapsed and been shuttered, but they were cleared and reopened. The shops had been emptied for anything uh, potentially useful for the war effort, but they are now full of shiny new goods available for purchases. The only thing that seemed to change were the number of American flags, and of course the endless stream of wealth and resources pumping out of the many ports of West Africa directly into the New World. Ironically, some might say that there was hardly a change, rather than simply the old reasserting itself. Some raised the alarm, voicing concerns that Americans had simply arrived to become the new colonial overlords in place of the French, the British, and everyone else. To this, they were pointed to page after page to prove otherwise. The peoples of West Africa waved their own flags, singing their own anthems, fighting their own armies, and for their own land. It was merely that American companies, having arrived originally to serve their fellow countrymen in arms, fighting for freedom, also now wished to cater to West Africans. Having better technological capabilities, they rebuilt infrastructure, vital service generation, and healthcare facilities to better, a better standard than before. What was there to complain about? In a forgotten office in the Free French Government, occupied by a subdivision of a committee, subcommittee of the Native Self Government Group, a solitary figure began reading economic data prepared by the American Electric Power Company regarding key deliverables and vital resource structuring. Scattered through the endless jargon, excessive technical data was one of the arching themes, overarching themes. Tracing the ownership of almost anything in the region from public utilities to private companies and to land usually resulted in a land that moved further and further away from the African coast and closer and closer to the land of the free. For our eyes and under our noses, the West African infrastructure will make it easier to exert influence into the regional economy. Because, my god, we need it. Plus 14, huh? Again, this is a very progressive campaign. Let's go back to commitments. Probably not. Um, anything else here? Nope. So we're doing that too. Rights of the workers. There you go, surplus. Oh, I still want a surplus. It hurts our debt, but whatever. Death of Salazar. Campaign for support. This administration is operating in full understanding that it will hold itself to the needs of the people. We do not function without a mandate from those who had had and not voted for us in November 64. Any act we undertake must have the support of a good majority of Americans. Unfortunately, so many remain doubtful, even hostile to our platforms as a wide assortment of reasons. A weak mandate inevitably leads to weak government, and in turn leading to undoing what it has thus far accomplished. To prevent such a scenario, White House strategists have planned a comprehensive information awareness campaign in the coming months. And above everything we have at our disposal, media outlets, loyal pundits and personalities, grassroots activists, even the president himself, addressing the American people's concerns in person and on the airwaves. With this comes the hope that more Americans join the MPP's ranks, providing the administration with their full support of his legislative agenda. Increased popularity for the bill, probably will get better too. Planning sessions with Guy. The VP and the B have been talking for hours in the Oval Office, trying to plan the next step four. However, the reality of the divisive and fractious politics within the National Progressive Pact, especially in the center faction, have been complicated matters. While they almost universally support Robert Kennedy's president, the two wings have their own interests and policy goals. While it's an ally on many issues, a few conflicting points are just that much harder to deal with. On one end, you have the union guys, labor leaders seeking to expand the power of workers' unions in the face of the big corporations and hostile money to interests, protecting and increasing the rights of collective bargaining, safer working conditions, and job security. On the other hand are the social welfare proponents, seeking to strengthen the safety net to catch those that fall through the cracks, tackling poverty and homelessness, and giving every American the chance to make a decent living, usually through the higher taxes on the rich. The problem is that it's darn near impossible to push both agendas at the same time, partially due to the opposition that would come from those rich and powerful fat cats that would rather keep their power over their workers, and the vast fortunes away from those that need it. So it leaves the president with two options. Either focus his political capital on trying to boost pensions for the public and private sector that will help unionize workers, or to increase the federal minimum wage to help those stuck on the bottom of society. Well, they're both good sides and ideas. Only one will be able to get through Congress easily, so which are we going to piss off this time? Six of one, half a dozen on the other. Okay, that's a good campaign, campaign for support, of course. Cesar Chavez. Nowadays, one cannot speak of the American labor movement without mentioning Cesar Chavez. The Californian labor leaders are now and have skyrocketed since the national strikes have passed, having won the hearts of millions with the steadfast defense of their rights and just dues. Poor farmers in both the same state and across the country utter his name in the same breath as the Lord God, thanking him for the protection of United Farm Workers bestowed upon them in the tens of thousands of others. This, the administration cannot negotiate in good faith with American labor without approaching their representatives its technologies. For much of it, Senor Chavez is nothing less than a blessed idol. An earnest chat with the proverbial shepherd of America's farmers will show them that we are committing to uplifting them from their demeaning, humiliating stature and treat them as they, fundamental, as they are, the fundamental pillars of society. Oh. Oh, give it independence. Well, okay. News to us, but okay. Uh, oh, look at this. Schneikies. That's not enough. Talk with the Democrats. Do we have more room to do stuff? Economic Opportunity Act? Well, we'll see. Um, okay, well, we'll see. We can't cancel. Yeah, I can't manually cancel, which kind of does suck, but whatever. Um, reprimand the police? Because we can. And in the penitentiaries, offices, academies, and cruisers from east to west, the words to serve and protect shine bright when struck by the midday sun. 
It's a motto that which America's police force have chosen for themselves, both a summary of their duties and a pledge to the people at large. For those America's police have sworn to serve to protect, however, their motto rings hollow in many infamous incidents. They neither served nor protected the American people. Instead, they served those with the money to acquire their services and protected the assets which they deeply prized. Securing the backing of the American worker entails ensuring their safety from their own law enforcement. But they may not tread upon the rights like they had in the past. Their brutality is one that Kennedy, President Kennedy, endeavors to restrain through both talk and action. RFK's police speech backfires. President Kennedy's speech in regards to policing in America has drawn a mixed reaction, to say the least. Documenting uh, corruption, abuses, racism, and violence by the man in the blue from Coast Coast has been well received and applauded by civil rights leaders, victims of police brutality, and those that have spent their careers trying to investigate the kickbacks, bribes, property seizures, and more that happen every day, and how the police union protect bad cops and punish those that speak out. But the speech is also outraged, has also outraged, has outraged from across the nation. Many citizens are considering what the president said a little more than slander, betting all the cops in the nation based on a, on a few bad apples. Police unions from New York to L.A. are in an uproar announcing the president and vowing to use their resources to promote or support politicians that actually give a darn about the police and public safety. Even the NPP. RFK has received major blowback. Some of the Nationalist Caucus have denounced the president, saying he's not patriotic enough to support those that preserve law and order. Some even shifted their loyalty from the NPP to the Democrats in response. Meanwhile, some members of the Progressive Caucus, especially those that are really more concerned with that are opposed from the outside of the nation by the Japan fascism and with the civil rights in America, are moving into the Nationalist camp, thinking that the president's gone too far after all. Police forces of the FBI to county sheriffs have been busy trying to root out the dangers of spies and agitators. It's not helping to have their methods motive question. Needless to say, the speech may have done a lot to expose the bad aspects of the men, and also the increasing number of women who will police the nation and their power, but the political cost of Bobby Kennedy could have been much stronger than he could have anticipated. Who will police the police? So, that's not good for us, but whatever. Underlying problem? Well, un-American culture. They go by many names, colored, Afro-American, black, negro, and more fun words. Poor ghettos and ramshackle slums define the communities, simultaneously closed and far from the services offered freely to the white American. Hatred and isolation define their experience. Establishments close their doors, uh, or close their shut, doors shut at the presence. Law men their every footstep, whereas the Nazis have the Jews and the Japanese have the Koreans, and these descendants of African slaves are America's own brand of outcasts, proving to all that the words which hearken to our nation's founding ideals are worthless less than mud. True equality cannot be achieved until our outcasts are lifted up to the standard and dignity for which all Americans rightly deserve. For this purpose, President Kennedy swears to continue advancing the cause even after the victory in Congress over the Civil Rights Act and roots. Feeding my family on a factory wage? Get real, John. How the heck am I supposed to do that when the boss is in a suit spending all in the swanky penthouses in New York? Well, the only thing I can rely on is Mick in the Army. And they don't pay him all that much either, but I'm glad he's in Australia. I don't know how it's going to tell him if I saw how rough things are getting in Michigan, of course. No, you don't hear it from me. You can't speak honestly these days unless you want a social crucifixion, but it's a darn shame where the country's going. I'm supposed to be one of those better ones off. I have a car limousine or a, car, a house and a vacation, but F me. Those way, those up at hippies and welfare babies act, I'm going to be paying for the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Sometimes we baptize adults at church, symbolizing the joining a wider community of believers in God. Now I wonder if we baptize anybody, who would we welcome? Uh, oh, who would welcome them? The pews empty out every year, and children turn their backs on God for rock and soul, and the politicians aren't helping either. Sometimes I think they are they encourage godliness, of course. Uh, they used me for a war no one remembers. I went to war thinking I'd serve my country in freedom, and ended up with an arm gone and a discharge letter remember me by. I don't regret serving with honor, but I regret being used by those with none. And if I was left, you understand that. Um, what else we got around here? Anything we can do to help increase the garrison strength? Probably not. Increase the government trust. So yes, might as well at this point. Home front. Um, we're doing all right. Any draft exemptions? Well, it's all right for now. We're doing okay. Um, I did have to redo this just a little bit. Inflation's looking pretty bad right now, though, um, because th these two acts kept failing. I had to reload this one. So we did this one earlier. No child left behind, I think. So that one was. I had to redo that one. I had to redo this one too as well. So that's why we're doing an American unculture. Stop the redlining. Respect of racism does not mean manifest solely through hateful insults, lynch mobs, and segregated buses and burning crosses. This creeping devil makes his well known blueprints and sign rules. City plans and well crafted models of subdivisions, suburbs, uh, mouths obfuscated in plain sight. Uh, public maps and pure intuition veil the chicanery hiding beneath the facades of neutral gray concrete. Also, in the future, I am going to go ahead and do uh, uh, Romney, so I apologize for not being able to get Romney in this campaign. My bad. But we're going to go with uh, Goldwater for this one, too, anyway. So, Send down with Chavez. RFK has traveled to L.A., California, to meet with labor leader Marx activist Cesar Chavez, a lot of leader of the Latino American the civil rights community and organizer for the poorly paid and treated farm workers of California. His influence within the National Progressive Pact is huge. So it's imperative that the president work with Chavez if he wants to get his agenda through Congress. Of course, it could be tricky to work with Chavez, who has positioned himself to the left of even Bobby Kennedy. It may see the president is not doing enough or going too slow in efforts to reform the American economy and society, but with hundreds of thousands of supporters of the U.S., but he's also focused especially in the Southwest. His influence could sink or swim in the efforts to reform America. 
But one way to get Chavez's support is to talk to him and convince him. Thank you for meeting with me, Chavez, and support the president. After an hour-long meeting with, between uh, RFK and Cesar Chavez, uh, the labor leaders have given a short speech to supporters, uh, reporters and announced that he supports the president's goals and agenda. While I cannot deny that there's always been more to be done uh, to improve the lives and rights of the Latinos and all Americans, Chavez told me, the reporters, I believe that President Kennedy has their best interests at heart and will fight for all workers. That's just a small step in the way to true equality and justice, but we support the president's efforts to advance our rights. That was the best outcome possible from the meeting, so now as many labor leaders among progressive supporters are vocally supporting RFK's new action laws, as Chavez's full throated endorsement is just a, just a sign they need him. See uh, if C.S. Puda, it can be done. Still 13, even after all the fallout. Got a lot of things riding on this. A lot of things. That's a good more political power, which means we have more political power because I don't have to spend all that to try to get, buy more votes, basically. Polls are updated. Operation commenced. Um, chat with Goldwater. Progressive nationalist. You know what? We'll do these two then. Spend a bit more money. The 1968 uh, National Progressive Primaries. We're going to do this. Please read it. Four more years. Well, we're probably not going to do four more years for them. We'll do Barry Goldwater eventually, but I don't think this campaign we're going to do that. We don't want to do them later again, because I've played them like, a few times already, and Barry's a lot of fun, but not for this campaign. Nice. How the French Civil War is so firing, huh? The black man's misery, even after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, African Americans, of course. Uh, well, face hideous discrimination and inequality, and often find themselves proud of the basic rights afforded to those in the pale of persuasion. We cannot stop here. Initiatives like integrating schools by busing in black students and increasing racial integration in America's suburbs and black and neighborhoods may be contentious across the nation, not just the South, but we can't let the overly vocal racists sway our progress towards integration. Besides, sure, the Southern majority supports freedom of America, the spirit of freedom and liberty for the fellow citizens intended by our founding fathers. What our opposition we face is our manifest duty to drive the nation towards full equality for all Americans, no matter what race. America's claim we are the sculptor, integration, and the good life. The underlying problem. Who watches Watchmen? Oh boy. Uh, well intended or otherwise, separate yet equal has been a shambolic failure. Uh, spoken and unspoken rules dictating what the colored man live, live lives which mirror, but do not converge with the white man has yet to fulfill their promises to restore his dignity or improve his fortune. Southern knights and bells down still in the countryside manners while their slaves watch with envy from hotels of stick and mud. Much attention has been paid to keeping white and black separate, but not for making both others equal. It is said that experience is the greatest teacher. If so, then, they do it wins, huh? Um, so then why doing away with separating black from white will teach you respect for fellow Americans' dignities while well, far better than any segregated school can teach the virtues of a hopelessly immoral system? In doing so, we will found well, foundations for society far more willing to give us fortune of the good life they deserve. The National Labor Relations Act, with Congress convinced the American people of peace, there is no better time to hold the culmination of work with money and time to vote. The National Liberation, La oh, Labor Act. It's one of the several proposals comprising what history will consider the most comprehensive piece of economic reform reduced to Capitol Hill. Designed to protect the American worker from severe exploitation of their work, its articles formalize a large expansion of the rights, an eight-hour work day, the freedom to join unions and more. The war in poverty may not even end in our generations, or ever this before too as well, I think. Yeah. If you want to finish reading this, please go ahead. I apologize for rereading this again. But, uh, yeah, it is what it is. I'm just waiting until elections are over. And then we can do whatever we want, pretty much, because we'll have more support too. God, I sound like a politician. Jesus Christ, I... Politicians. Hey, back up to 14, not bad. Um, here, campaign here. New Mexico has no senators for election this year, but whatever. Campaign for civil rights. Grows more divided. Campaign with Wallace. Campaign where we haven't. I guess we could. A little more money, but whatever. What's money to for RFK? Stop the redlining. Among the myriad of other little humiliations they must suffer every day, African Americans often are not the victims of community sponsored informal segregation and redlining. Custom white people preventing blacks from settling in certain areas, enforcement of interracial ghettos by refusing loans, charging exorbitant interest rates, and engaging in discriminatory banking practices. Redlining is a time honored tradition of in homogeneously white areas whose home white homeowners. Um, we want to remain so, needless to say, it needs to be stopped. We want to properly integrate America's towns and suburbs. Re restricting redlining will be very popular with business owners and bankers, as well as the wider white population in general, but the unpopularity of our policies has never stopped us from trying to do the right thing before. To deal with the red line, of course. Uh, we can either do what's right and go hard on banning the practice, erasing every loophole, or we could try to preserve some of our political capital and put some small but meaningful restrictions into place instead. The reactionaries won't be happy either way, but if we compromise, we might be able to avoid that outrage for once. Erase it, boards forever, or what? Air on the side of caution? I don't think so. I'm not here to have ca be cautious. Polls are updated. Oh, red lines erased. 
And what's coming is welcome surprise. There are strict restrictions on redlining have generated very little blowback from the community, and even the usual suspects in Congress have been fairly muted on the issue. It appears that we must judge that the average middle American disapproves of discriminatory banking and lending practices as much as we do. Black people no longer be subjected to uh, shady financial practices. They have kept them in the ghettos across America and will face significantly less pushback when they attempt to settle in historically white communities. All in all, we better remove one of the biggest obstacles to the racial integration of America's neighborhoods and for once doing the right thing that wasn't painful at all. And thank heavens for that. Everything will get better. Wow, minus 0.36. That's not bad. Right? So, oh, it's that's over too. That's good. Don't want any rights in mock campaigns unless they're really beneficial for us. Uh, what else we got around here? Alright. Ah, they run a campaign, eh? Great. Calamitous campaign. Oh, that really hurts pretty badly. Plus nine, that's not good. That's pretty bad, actually. We need more than plus nine or to iron. Everyone's ever written anything knows that feeling, staring at a piece of paper knowing that something should already be there. No matter how many cups of coffee one has, there were some days that the words just going to come out despite everything. Today was not one of those days, at least not for Jean Kirkpatrick. As she sat at her desk, the words poured out of her head like a stream of water, one unhindered by the dam of the writer's block. The splash onto the page, fulfilling it to the brim with new and new interesting ideological texts. Well, call them new is a bit of a stretch. Refined would be a better word. Reforged, maybe. Kirkpatrick was taking the raw iron of her hit 1965 essay, Dictatorship and Double Standards, putting it through a fire. She was refining those ideas into steel. She was still working on what to form this steel would take. She had so many options, with a book and the ideas with hell within be a hammer. To forge an organization of free nations into a new, stronger alliance, or would it be forged into a whetstone to sharpen America's talents? Or maybe these ideals be forged into a dagger that would be pointed at the throat of fascism and totalitarianism around the world. Just another question Kirkpatrick would need to answer. She was expanding on the ideas of her essay, which offered heavy critiques of the foreign policy failures of the administration of the National Progressive Pact in 1964. In that essay, she'd come up with and introduce the concept of the Kirkpatrick Doctrine, the idea that aid should be given to authoritarian countries if they were opposed to totalitarian ones. It was this essay that led to her being a common side in congressional hearings and running and winning Virginia's 10th congressional district. The ideas within the essay still needed to be refined, however, and she was doing what she was doing now. That was what she was doing. She'd come up with something good, the fire grows hotter. Redraw school districts. What can America gain from a people so bitterly to buy that they cannot work together to propel it to higher heights? In the foolish and a full-heartedly pursuit to deny Afro-Americans their liberty and happiness, the vestiges of slave power nonetheless sought to create, and had created, a deep crevice that separates one America from another living in mutual animus. And this here, aided by the school system, which thanks to segregation and impressed upon children from the outset that those of a different color which they do not belong to the community in which they belong. To President Kennedy, the next milestone for a newer, better, and more just American society is a thorough redrawn of American school districts. It's a task that will take generations, but integrated schools will ensure that the bonds between black Americans and white Americans, once severed by a growing chasm, will eventually heal. So shall America be truly united once again, or perhaps so shall America be truly united for the first time in history. Racism, Southern Fried. With the demise of redlining, many neighborhoods across America have rather been integrating as better off of African Americans move into traditionally white communities, soaking the fury of middle class suburbanites who can't imagine any worse than having a black neighbor. Naturally, despite our best hope that people's better nature would take over and this would lead to a new era of racial harmony, there's been widespread discontent in integrated communities, particularly in the South, some which have been escalated. This morning, one such incident arising from the integration pushback appeared on the front page of President Kennedy's newspaper, making him grimace from something other than his morning grapefruit. Apparently, a pair of black teenagers whose families had recently moved into a previously redlined suburb of Atlanta attempted to order lunch at the local, local greasy spoon diner, and the owner, one less dramatic, refused to serve them and asked him to leave. Despite this obnoxiously being a illegal since the passing Civil Rights Act, Maddox's supposed right to choose his customers has become Dixie's cause du jour. Maddox has already appeared on several right-leaning Southern news radio stations, become bemoaning the sudden change in his community's demographic makeup. We have to respond as quickly before it spirals out of control to make it publicly known that the regressive racism of Maddox and his ilk has no place in modern America. However, despite being a thoroughly unpleasant man, Maddox has gained a strong measure of support from the Southern whites and reactionary days everywhere. We could formally prosecute him and make an example of the risk of stoking the political fire, or we could give him the slap on the wrist and make a disapproval known without starting a fight. Throw the book at him, it's going to all explode in our face. Broken. So I save because I want to do this one and see where we're at. Because I don't want to piss off too many people just yet. Because right now, this is not looking as good as it should. Nine is not good. This goes down, which is not bad. Increasing support from everyone else is not bad either. And a cheeseburger with a side of intolerance. 
As we expected, prosecuting Maddox for illegally denying service to his black customers has been highly contentious. Radio demagogues and the right wingers of Congress have been hollering all week that will bring cruel and unjust, pushing the angle that Maddox is a victim of the federal government punishing average Joes for setting the rules of their own businesses. Apparently, willfully ignoring, ignoring the fact that denying service to someone based solely on their race is just as legal as any other crime. Unsurprisingly, the South is infer. Over our treatment of Maddox, and we're also got a fair amount of grumbling from the more prejudiced whites north of the Mason-Dixon line. Nevertheless, this was the right thing to do. People need to understand that integration is a feature and they need to accept it if they want to do business, despite the blowback. At least African Americans know we're willing to go to bat for them, even at a political rest to ourselves. So hopefully the trust we're building up with them will prove worthwhile to the ballot box. Integration is here to stay. Get used to it. Education unprejudiced. The president looked out across a dozen of assembled journalists, notepads and tape recorders in hand, and in the artificial eyes of the TV cameras. Gathering his he took a deep breath and began. My fellow Americans, I came to you today to speak on one of the greatest injustices facing the nation today, and that being the equality of education faced by many of our citizens. In this modern age, African Americans still lack many of the resources and opportunities provided to their white brothers. This should not be so. The great nation was founded by men of many backgrounds and cultures, who came together to create a common bond between them all, to create a nation in which all could have the same rights and privileges, and could enjoy freedom and liberty without impediment. America was founded on the principle that all of its citizens would be free and equal, and the freedom of all of our citizens is diminished when not all Americans are equal. Are we to say that this is the land of the free for all those but with black skin? From now on, when some of the less enlightened say that black children should be excluded from white schools, or some of those only know, in our ongoing fight against injustice, or promote the integration of schools across America so that all of our nation's children are privy to the same essential rights and opportunities? The press pounced on that like hyenas on an injured gazelle. Knowing well full that discussion of integration would stoke the flames of the controversy, nevertheless, Kennedy felt himself prepared for all that might follow. Whatever happened, he knew that he was doing the right thing. America's changing and all must change with it. Still nine. Um. Alright, so this is what I was worried about. No room for support. Well, that's why we're going to do this one, just in case. And Nashville as well. There we go. That's better. So that's 40. 50. We're out of political power. As long as we have 50, we should be good, right? 40. 50. Out of 98, so we should be good. And we have the VP, so we should be able to pass it, no matter what. If not, I'm going to be kind of pissed. That's why we saved up our political power. We're 100%, so... Getting more progressives on board would be better for us, too. Surplus, good. Oh, that hurts us a little bit. So the campaign's not bad. Come on, I know we can pass it. Come on. God dang it. Poverty reduction is not enough. A plus 10, I like that too. Come on. <sighs> come on, come on, come on. It fails, what do you mean? Okay, this is definitely bugged. If you want to read about this, please go ahead. I'm not going to accept this result. That's complete crap. We had 50 senators on our side. That's complete crap. Crapperoni. So, it's close to the election, so we'll probably do one more focus. Uh, we'll probably do redraw the school districts just in case first. Um, so, that'll be good to do National Ethics Commission. That's not bad to get more daily political power. It does increase the cost, though. Plan suburbs. We'll probably do un American institutions. The Federal Bureau of Investigation. Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Agency. In theory, these agencies comprise the arm of America's law dedicated to the shield of the country and citizens from threats both foreign and domestic. In theory, this tried and a plethora of others are the eyes in the dark which watch over America while she sleeps. A party of gaze that gives much but asks for little, and whose honest, dutiful, and law abiding work is in its own reward. Never before has the practice diverged from theory more distinctly or distantly than the alphabet soup agencies that form the so called cult of intelligence. In their zeal to protect America from the threats both real and imagined, they have trampled upon the rights of the very citizens from which form America's body politic. For the good of the country, something must be done to rein them in. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and we'll see you tomorrow as we continue on with President Kennedy and eventually get to George Romney sometime on this channel. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.